<laughs> All right, I, I'll, I'll get started now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This morning, Assistant Secretary General for Africa, Martha Ama Akiapobi, briefed the Security Council on the situation in Sudan. She said that the conflict continues to have immense repercussions on the country and its people, and emphasized that now is the time to end the senseless war and return to negotiations. Briefing the Council as well was Edem Wasornu, Director of Operations and Advocacy at the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. She said that the situation is particularly alarming in Khartoum, as well as Darfur and Kordofan regions. She added that 80% of hospitals across the country are not functioning, and that 14 million children in Sudan, half of all children in the country, need humanitarian support. Their remarks were shared with you. Also, in a statement issued earlier today, the humanitarian coordinator in Sudan, Clementine Nkweta Salami, called on parties to the conflict to ensure safe passage for civilians fleeing the fighting. She warned that many people trapped by the violence have been unable, and in some cases actively prevented, from seeking safety elsewhere. Those that can flee are vulnerable to abuse, theft, and harassment. More than four million people have now fled the fighting inside Sudan or across the country's borders, according to the International Organization for Migration. That's more than four million people in less than four months. In the past week alone, more than 261,000 people were displaced by the conflict. And our peacekeeping colleagues in the Democratic Republic of the Congo are telling us that following Monday's attack on civilians by presumed members of the Kodeko armed group in Largu, in Ituri province, MONUSCO evacuated two wounded civilians by helicopter to a hospital in Bunia. Together with the Congolese Armed Forces, the UN mission also facilitated transportation for another civilian to a local hospital to receive medical care. The mission further reports that UN peacekeepers and national security forces are continuing to protect civilians who sought shelter at the nearby Drodro camp for displaced people. They're also patrolling in the area. Meanwhile, in a separate incident on Monday, UN peacekeepers also deployed to the Savo site for displaced people. In this location close to Jugu in Uturi, they responded to alerts from the community over the alleged presence of Kodeko members nearby. No incident was reported. We have an update from the Central African Republic. At a press conference in Bangui today, our peacekeeping mission, MINUSCA, announced that it is handing over newly renovated facilities to Central African authorities to house that country's first permanent military tribu tribunal and national commission for border management. This support is in line with the mission's mandate to support national security sector reform. Meanwhile, the mission also provided an update on last week's attack by an unknown armed group on the village of Diki, about 140 kilometers from Mandele in the Bamingi Bangoran prefecture. Yesterday, a joint mission made up of UN peacekeepers and Central African security forces arrived in the village to assess the situation, and we can report that it is calm. The mission also announced its support to an investigation by national security forces into the incident in which 13 civilians were killed. We have a quick update on Ukraine. The humanitarian coordinator, Denise Brown, today visited Bogrovsk in the Donetsk region, where 36 hours ago, two massive strikes left dozens of civilians, including children, killed and injured. She noted that in addition to homes, a playground was completely destroyed. Ms. Brown met with local authorities to determine how much more humanitarian support is needed. As mentioned yesterday, our partners have immediately mobilized assistance for survivors. The Secretary General sent a message today to mark the 78th anniversary of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki. He said that we mourn those killed whose memory will never fade, and we recognize the brave Habaksha, whose powerful and harrowing testimonies will forever stand as a reminder that we must achieve a world free of these inhumane weapons. The Secretary General said that despite the terrible lessons of 1945, humanity now confronts a new arms race in which nuclear weapons are being used as tools of coercion. He said that we will not sit idly by as nuclear armed states race to create even more dangerous weapons. The full statement is online. You will have seen that yesterday we issued a statement in which the Secretary General welcomed the understanding reached this week by the United Nations and the government of Syria on the continued use for the next six months of the Bab al-Hawa border crossing to deliver humanitarian assistance to millions of people in need in northwest Syria. The Secretary General also welcomed Syria's extension of its authorization for the UN to use the Bab al-Salam and al-Rai border crossings for an additional three months, 
as well as its consent to cross the lines within Syria at Sarmada and Sarakib for the delivery of assistance for the next six months. Turning to Yemen, the Special Envoy of the Secretary General for Yemen, Hans Grunberg, concluded a two-day visit to Riyadh, where he met with the President of Yemen's Presidential Leadership Council, Rashad Al-Alimi, along with other council members in Riyadh. They discussed ongoing mediation efforts to agree on measures to improve living conditions, implement a nationwide ceasefire, and resume an inclusive Yemeni-owned political process under UN auspices to reach a sustainable political settlement. In Riyadh, Special Envoy Grunberg met with Saudi Ambassador to Yemen, Mohammed al Jaber to explore ways to enhance cooperation between regional and international stakeholders to support Yemen's progress towards a political solution. Following a week-long suspension of services in Ain al-Hilwa camp in Lebanon due to armed clashes, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, known as UNRWA, has now resumed its operation within the camp. The agency reported that Health Center 2 was reopened today. Sanitation laborers have commenced clearing streets of piled up garbage and disinfecting less affected areas. Working in partnership with various stakeholders, the agency is preparing to conduct assessments and clear remnants of war from the affected zones once these become accessible. And just to flag that Dorothy Klaus, director of UNRWA affairs in Lebanon, will be the noon briefing guest tomorrow and will speak about the situation in Ain el Hilwe. She visited the camp today to oversee the situation and the partial reinstatement of the agency's operations. And today is the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples, and the th theme is youth. In his message, the Secretary General says that young people are leaders in the global climate action movement. They advocate justice and equality, celebrate their cultures, advance human rights, and raise awareness of indigenous history and issues around the world. And that's it for me. Are there any questions? Yes, Edie. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Two questions. First, um, the U.S. ambassador um, just denounced the Sudanese government for uh, telling the United Nations that if um, Volker Perthes, the U.N. envoy for Sudan, briefed the Security Council, it would... Uh, order the UN to cease operations in the country. Can you please confirm that that happened? Uh, she said that this was done by the foreign ministry. Uh, I, I cannot confirm that. Uh, what I can say is that decisions on who speaks uh, at the UN are taken by the UN Secretariat, and we decided uh, for this briefing uh, to have Martha Poby uh, do the briefing on the political side. Uh, Mr. Perth continues uh, to be uh, the special representative of the Secretary General uh, dealing with Sudan, and we expect him to do uh, further briefings to the Council as, as, uh, as and when he needs to. Okay. Um, I guess we're not going to get further with that. On Bab al-Hawa, uh, two questions. First, when is the crossing going to be open? And secondly, um, the UN had several very specific objections. Can you tell us how those specific objections, um, which included um, who was going to be allowed to deliver aid, who was going to be in charge, et cetera, were resolved? Uh Certainly, uh, the fact that we have the understandings in place is itself a sign that uh, the issues were resolved. Mr. Griffiths had been engaging uh, with the government of Syria and other interested parties, and he had worked uh, to reconcile differences and, and ensure that we can continue cross-border humanitarian uh, assistance with all the key modalities in place uh, in a principled manner that allows for humanitarian engagement with all parties and which safeguards the UN's operational independence. And so that has been taken care of. Regarding your first question about the Bab al Hawa crossing, we stand ready to resume aid operations through the Bab al Hawa crossing as soon as possible. Uh, it may take uh, some days, obviously, to get the trucks moving. I don't expect anything to happen in the next few days, but, uh, but as soon as we uh, get the trucks going there, we'll let you know. Yes, please. Thank you, Farhan. Just for clarification, so obviously in July, 
it was in the Security Council when Russia, how do I put this, failed to agree on an extension of the UN mandate that allowed for Babel Howard to be used. And so just to clarify, does the UN no longer need to go to the Security Council to resume using Babel Hawa? Uh, it's certainly Security Council authorization of crossing points is something we've asked for and we continue to ask for that. Uh, in lieu of that, uh, we have had these understandings with the government of Syria, and we certainly appreciate that, and I believe uh, the statement uh, that we put out uh, re reflects our views on that. But, uh, but obviously, uh, uh, the sort of Security Council authorizations we, we've asked for is something that we believed was necessary, and we continue to believe that. Thank you. And uh, if that's it, uh, then I will turn the floor over to Paulina Kubiak. <laughs> 